Good morning. The hour has arrived. Uh, it's nice to see you all here. Welcome to the Science Circle. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago about an infomercial regarding Project Moonbase, and now we're really excited to present to you uh, a few more ideas about it from the people who have agreed to start uh, to, to host some of the teams, to begin with some of the teams. We're calling this Project Moonbase. It's an activity of the Science Circle. And we're really pleased to have something like this going in our 15th anniversary year. Is that this is uh, actually a real world activity. There are several space agencies involved in a real life project moon base, European Space Agency, Japanese, NASA, and Canadians. And Science Circle wants to be involved in this too. And this is our entry into that universe. This we see as an opportunity to do all of the things that Science Circle is designed to do, to understand, to learn, to interact internationally about science within Second Life in a way that has implications in real life. And the implications in real life are something that you will hear about uh, throughout these presentations. And I quote to you um, astronaut Mae Jemison, whom I heard on the radio just this week talking about the moon base, and when asked about why we're going there, she said, all of the things we need to live on the moon, same things we need on Earth, including getting along with one another. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant, and that's not a bad thing for us to think about in the context of this project. So with that in mind, and without any further ado, this is the group that's going to present to you today. Um, we're all seated up front, and we will go in this sequence. So without any further delay, I'll turn things over to our first speaker, Tab Scott, who is our project lead. Tab, take it away. Thank you, Sumo. Um, appreciate the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Um, the, I'm Tab Scott, and I'm in Second Life. And in real life, I'm an architect that's been involved with NASA through NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley since 1977. And I've been involved in the transferring of technology from the space program to applications in the building industry since that time. So my interest in doing this Moonbase project in Second Life is because it'll involve science and technology that is directly related to my work in architecture. So we're encouraging you to think about how this could relate to some of the work that you're doing either personally or professionally. And um, for me, it's creating buildings that are sustainable for people and the planet Earth. And the space technology that, that will be involved in uh, taking place in real life related to the moon base uh, is regarding sustainability of humans and the moon. And like Sumo was saying, we're going to be learning a lot about sciences that apply to humans, both on Earth and on the moon. And so our um, study in Second Life is going to be very much related to the real life uh, study of moon base or moon bases um, on the moon over the next few years. And our presentation today is really an invitation for you to become involved in international collaborative work in the virtual world of Second Life. We'd like you to consider joining Science Circle as a member if you aren't already a member. Um, and as well as to consider joining a moon base project, uh, the moon base project as a member of one of our teams that you'll be hearing about um, as our panel discusses um, the different areas that they're interested in this morning. And we want you to consider joining for two equally important reasons. One is, of course, what you'd like to contribute to this project as far as your knowledge and talent. And the other one that is equally important is what would you like to learn about in this project that you don't know about? that this project will be exploring. Because we'd like to encourage members to both contribute to and benefit from this exciting product project. And um, there'll be much for all of us to do and learn in this Moonbase project. And we want it to be something that is fun, interesting, and enjoyable for everyone. And one of the things I've discovered since joining the Science Circle, it already has some of the most interesting and entertaining and knowledgeable members in Second Life for you to meet and enjoy. So as you watch this presentation today, please consider joining Science Circle and participating as a member, a team member on one of the, on the moon base project on one of our teams. And each member um, of today's panel will explain a little bit more about this project. And then we'll be around to answer any questions that you may have at the end. And thank you very much for coming today. And we all look forward to your participation. Thanks a lot. OK, well, thank you, Terry. Uh, give me a few moments here to. 
get things lined up the way I need them. Well, hello everyone. I'm so happy to see you, see you all and I'm very happy to be part of this project. It's a very exciting project. Now what I'll be talking about is uh, what the science team will be doing. We're concerned with the scientific and technical considerations for lunar habitation. In other words, we're concerned about realism. And when I'm presenting this, really only an early draft. <clears throat> the full draft is going to take the help of so many people. Uh, in real life, I'm William Wall. I'm sure many of you know that already. And now, what I present here is an overview of uh, what the science team will be doing. And it's not even a complete overview. The way I will put this is what I'm presenting today is only a fraction of what I've done. And <coughs> what I've done is only a fraction of what needs to be done. We're going to start with some motivations. Now, Terry's already, list, uh, already explained the motivation for doing this project. Why would we want to do this project? And, and Phil is going to go into that a bit more. <coughs> but I, there are other levels of motivation, which I'll talk about briefly today. Environmental challenges of living on the lunar surface. Um, well, you can't really live on the lunar surface without shielding, so you want to live underground usually. Um, so the habitats will be underground or maybe on the surface with lots of shielding. have to think about energy sources. Where are we going to live on the moon? Different kinds of transportation on the moon and around the moon. Communications, and I'd be surprised if there aren't other topics that could be done that I haven't listed here. <coughs> So let's consider this motivation. Why are we concerned with um, scientific and technical issues? Well, because we want a realistic moon base. And we want it realistic because it's going to form the foundation for a learning experience. It'll become a great vehicle for teaching STEM subjects. And for those of you who don't know, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. <coughs> this can be an aspiring way of learning science and engineering and other issues um, and other areas. So even if you're not interested in joining us, you might want to follow what we're doing anyway, because it'll be interesting to follow at the very least. But now what about the real life motivation? Why would we want people living on the moon? You can make very good scientific arguments and commercial arguments for having some kind of human presence on the moon, maybe in the form of a robotic presence, automated presence, but why do you want to have people actually living on the moon? Are there good reasons for that? <coughs> and I would argue that there are. This is basically um, the overarching reason. It directly or indirectly improves life on Earth through innovations in science, of course. You could have medical, psychological, sociological studies of humans living in an isolated environment, isolated in a way that no humans have ever been isolated before. And this requires humans living on the moon to really do these kinds of studies, but also there could be innovative new medical therapies. For example, we have to acclimate to higher gravity. If someone's living on the moon for a long time, or maybe even born on the moon, how will they go to Earth? Because of the high, uh, they have to deal with the higher gravity. So this could lead to a medical revolution in itself, in developing therapies for uh, accomplishing, strengthening the human body appropriately. <clears throat> also, there are going to be innovations in engineering and construction. These are occurring on Earth already. I mean, if you look at this, I mean, this is a 3D house printer used by a company called Icon in, in Austin, Texas. This is called the Vulcan 2 host printer. <clears throat> so innovations on Earth are going to help um, housing on the moon, but housing on the moon will lead to innovations which will help housing on Earth. <clears throat> yeah, demineralization of bone. That's a good point to take, line. There are a number of things that have to be dealt with when you <clears throat> coming back to high gravity. There are other <clears throat> reasons, other ways that will improve life on Earth. Inspiring environmentalists, inspiring explorers. Explorers expand the sphere of human influence, which will, yes, it will improve life on Earth, the things that will be discovered. <coughs> this is a particularly important photo that was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts of the Earth as they were coming around the moon. And you can see, I mean, this, this really galvanized the environmental movement, because what you see here, this beautiful oasis of life next to this black, lifeless void. Earth is an oasis of life, and we must protect it. It is precious. Earthrise, exactly. <clears throat> so let's talk about this a bit. This sparked what's called the overview effect, and I had to look this up to a really good definition here. 
self-transcendent sense of awe precipitated by a particularly striking visual image. And here it is. Yeah, I mean, imagine seeing this. I mean, for the astronauts, this was exciting, but they only saw it for a short time. Imagine you have lunar inhabitants living on the near side. They have to be on the near side. They'll see the Earth continuously, <clears throat> year after year, day after day. And they'll see it in the same place in the sky to within, I don't know, a few degrees. There's some, there are librations of the moon. They'll be... They'll see changing weather patterns, changing phases. It will seem very much alive. This will supercharge. This will give a supercharged overview effect because this this will be <clears throat> they will be seeing this day after day, and it will really drive home the importance of sustainability because there will be sustainability issues on the moon, and they will also appreciate sustainability issues on on the Earth because it's this oasis of life, as I said before, that must be protected, and people living on the moon will really be able to appreciate that. And after you decide to live on the moon, you have to deal with the environmental challenges. I've listed them here in their connections, which I'm not really going to go into in detail today. But there are some outcomes here. <coughs> um, yeah, those are good questions. I, I don't know when these buildings are going to be built in the 2030s. Uh, perhaps. We'll see how that goes. Cosmic surface radiation. Cosmic radiation at the surface. Micrometeoroid impacts because of no atmosphere, no water. And abrasive lunar dust, this stuff is dangerous. <clears throat> it's like volcanic dust, fresh volcanic dust. So the surface is dangerous, and you don't want to live on the surface without a lot of shielding. Very often they'll be living underground, maybe in a habitat like this one. This is a lava tube on the moon. I've been I've seen a lava tube in, in Hawaii. They're they're impressive, impressive, hollowed out by lava, as you might expect. But you can have a huge area which is pressurized. You can have housing. You can have plants and gardens, and you can have farming inside. And I find this particularly interesting. Because of low gravity, you can strap on wings, and you can fly like a bird you know, on the tail, too. So I can easily imagine someone coming in for a landing and saying, I've just flown from the other side of the habitat. And boy, my arms are tired. And that won't be a joke. Think about that. Okay, recommendations I made to my fellow team members, but um, you know, we made to each other. And <clears throat> I'm making them to you as well. We, to really delve into these issues, we're going to need like at least three or four people, maybe probably more, to work on this, because this impacts on realism. <clears throat> and so it's very important. Also, the things we do, the action items, they can pre be presented to the science circle like I'm doing now. Because these can be used as recruitment tools, which is what we're doing now. We're trying to recruit you. We need help. And, yeah, we want to publish, if possible, in STEM journal papers. But here's an interesting idea. I mean, this is an old idea, which is, I know, everything old is new again. Stories. People have told stories around campfires for thousands of years to educate each other and entertain each other. This is a great way of teaching science if you write the story correctly, of course, and accurately. So that uh, pretty much sums up what I had to say. So um, thank you for your time, and we'll move on to uh, Phil's talk now. Well, thank you, Sozaji. Uh, my name is Phil Youngblood. I had the great opportunity to actually do some research back during the lunar landings at uh, Ames Research Center, in uh, NASA's Ames Research Center. And I agreed to head the education area because I have a PhD in education and about 25 years of experience in um, education at university level. Now, science and education are the guiding principles of the science circle's mission. When we first started thinking about a moon base, we realized there'd be a lot of science involved, and Syzygy, William, has just given you a sampling of that. And then we realized that there'd be a lot of opportunities to educate. So I'll talk to you more about these opportunities in a couple of weeks, but uh, today I'd like to give you an overview. Both science and education have their formal methods of doing things. In science, there's the scientific method and research methodologies. In education, there's the classroom and lab environments. But then there's the rest of the day. That's informal education. Learning is what we do every minute of the day to be able to interact with our world. 
We're constantly comparing what we encounter with what we know so that we know what to do next. Non-formal learning is what you do in a museum or when you explore. It's guided, but not as rigid in the way it presents learning. When we started thinking about a moon-based project, we realized that there'd be a lot of opportunities for all kinds of education. Every experienced educator knows that you can't teach anything. Education starts with the learner. By sharing this exciting new project with you, we hope that you'll think, this is interesting to me. I want to know more. We also realize that we need your help. As Syzygy mentioned, that is that the members you see on this panel don't have all the answers. More on that in a moment. As we thought about a moon base, we realized it could support all types of learning. For the physical learner, we'll be building a mock-up of a moon base in Second Life. So this will be a very hands-on project. For the verbal learner, we'll be writing and talking about what we're doing, describing the environment and what it might feel like to live on the moon. We'll also be writing a science fiction story. For the oral learner, we want you to imagine what sounds there would be on a moon base. And we'd love to find a musician who could find us appropriate moon music or a composer who will write something original. For the visual learner, the sights on the moon and space around it will be a wonder to behold. We need an illustrator to draw what we imagine. The moon's kind of a drab place, so we also need someone who knows color theory and the social impacts of color to select the colors for the moon base and equipment. For the logical learner, there are many opportunities, including science, instructions for our moon base residents and visitors, and a formal research paper about our project. For the social learner, there's also many opportunities ranging from how Science Circle members participate in the project and learn from it, as well as how residents live and work together in the moon base. For the solitary learner, the moon represents a familiar and yet an exciting new alien world in which to live. I want you to imagine what it would be like in a space where every step, every breath, every time you look up and see the Earth, Every time you go to the bathroom to think about throwing something away it will cause you to think differently than when you're down on Earth. So you might be thinking, I'm not an expert. How can I help? Well, as they say, welcome to the club. <laughs> no one's an expert here. But everyone can contribute, which is why we're asking you to help. Can you ask questions? We need to answer a lot of them. You may ask a question that, we, that no one else has. Can you write? As I mentioned, we'll be writing articles and a science fiction story. Can you draw? Drawing helps us to visualize. Can, do you know some science? Much science is involved. Are you an artist? Art and music helps us to imagine. And it's very socially soothing. Are you an educator? There'll be a lot to explain. Do you like to build? We'll be building a moon base in Second Life. So the Second Base Moon Base project is not just a mental exercise. As mentioned, many nations are actively planning to have a real base on the moon in the next decade or so. These nations are also actively involved in educating future scientists and engineers to make this a reality. So in summary, when we were thinking about how best to celebrate Second Life's 15th anniversary, we thought, what better way to do this than to apply the strengths of the Science Circle in working together on a challenging project? And we don't have the constraints that real-world agencies have. We don't have the financial or physical, physical risks. We have no set timeline. There's nothing we have to do or topics that we can't explore. So this type of project is interdisciplinary, it supports all types of learning, and we honestly believe that the Science Circle, as a globally diverse group of scientists, educators, and science enthusiasts, may be uniquely situated to make a real contribution in this area. So that's why we're talking to you today about this exciting new project and inviting you 
to join us in exploring it. Thank you. So, everybody, you, you excited yet? I know I am, and boy, welcome, and so glad you all came today. Um, the moon, Earth's moon, looms large in our skies, but also, as Suzuki was saying, in our imaginations and in the myths of our ancestors, the stories of our childhoods, who among us hasn't been inspired by the awesome beauty of a full moon? You know, you look out at one of those magical times and you see this enormous red ball in the sky before it turns white and rises. I know I'm inspired and have people have been since the beginning of time. So about me, when other children took teddy bears to bed, I took to bed a faintly glowing ball with craters of the moon imprinted. But it was only imprinted on one side. Anybody have any ideas why that might have been? Well, it was because at the time I was a child, no human had ever seen the far side of the moon. So nobody knew what kinds of craters or anything else might have been there. So along with the imagination, Earth's largest satellite, the moon, also affects our earthly lives in physical ways. Its gravitational pull is part of what creates our ocean tides. The cycles of life for both plants and animals are affected by the position of the moon and its reflected light and pull. For example, moon glow reflection is the only light that Arctic Ocean plankton have during the winter months of every year. It's only recently, though, within the lifetimes of many of us here today that humans have set foot on the moon. And since then, scientists who dreamed of releasing the moon's secrets have worked overtime and delivered a lot, including maps of what can be found below the surface. People today are planning to build permanent bases on the moon. In addition to the science and technology we need, there are social societal considerations unlike any that we have faced before. The two fundamental questions we will have to answer and answer again and again and again are, one, can we do it? Because that's the science of it. But the other equally important question is, should we do it? And that is the ethics of it. Whatever we put on the surface of the moon could remain there for eons. Since the moon has no atmosphere, there's no decomposition, no oxidation or weathering, because there's no weather. There's a little bit of space wind and the dust blows around, and as was mentioned, that's pretty abrasive, but still things would stay for eons. No decomposition. So, for instance, if we dig mines, the scars will not only remain there forever, but the largest of them will be visible from Earth. Materials that we remove from Moon and bring to Earth, or to Mars for that matter, will never be be replaced by natural processes. Whatever we humans do, no matter how large or how small, will change the moon, possibly significantly. This whole area lands us into the realm of ethics. So there are some critical questions that we have put are putting on the table here. Uh, there are more, but we want to at least begin 
this conversation with can anyone own the moon? That's a pretty basic one. And if so, who and how? And if not, how do we share? Who controls what happens on the moon and how anything is done? And I know I've read recently there are billionaires who believe they have the right to colonize the moon and corporations who, that are eager to get their hands on those mineral riches. So we need to ask ourselves and to plan for who makes and who gets to benefit from the decisions and actions regarding the moon. Since the moon affects all people on Earth, all people, every single one of us, how do we ensure that voices from all walks of life are included? And that we consider the opinions of a multitude of people. How everything pay is paid for, of course, is important, um, and by whom, but that'll be a matter of political negotiation. But that political negotiation also must be done within an ethical framework. So there are a few possible starting points and some historical examples. Uh, for creating this manifesto, this lunar code of ethics. Historically, we have the Code of Hammurabi, and that's 18th century before the current era. Uh, we have the Analects of uh, Kongji, who many of us know as Confucius, the Hippocratic Oath. But present day, there are also things like the Law of the Sea Treaty, which is a UN document uh, that was written in the 19, early 1980s. Right now, we have the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, Web for All. And then there's blockchain, or that version of things where it is electronically uh, moved around the world with consequences, financial consequences, legal cons consequences. But that's kind of an organic development at this point. Although there are uh, some groups like Oasis Open, which is try working on software, open source software standards, and um, the power of <clears throat> global collaboration and community. And then you have the International Space Station. Um, which is shared space. So considerations um, that the manifesto should address are things like government, governance, how do we make decisions? How do we handle change? How do we negotiate conflict? Planning for success. And very important is planning for disaster before catastrophe hits because it's too late when it does. So we here have an unprecedented, unprecedented opportunity to contribute to the development of an ethical framework for human habitation on the moon and beyond. And boy, does that have um, relevance for societies on Earth today. Our challenge is to ensure Right from the get-go, we include not only the science and technology, but also social justice and equity and environmental responsibility and sustainability. So I ask, who would like to join us in creating a manifesto for, of lunar ethics? Lawyers, anyone? Negotiators with international experience, philosophers, we're reuniting philosophy and science with this after a 500 plus year separation. Sociologists, science fiction writers, poets, artists, you have an opportunity to bring not only your varied talents and skills, but bring your curiosity, bring what intrigues you, because we'd love to have you. And if not you, talk to your friends. Do your friends have some of these skills, talents, and interests 
and you think they might want to contribute. So please do let us know. Now let me pass the mic here to Christy, who will bring what we've covered so far down to the personal level. And that includes not only behaviors and actions of individuals and groups, but also attitudes that make long-term living in restric restricted shared space even possible. Mission Psychologist Day, eh? what does that involve? Well, I've been asking myself what I can offer, just as I hope you're asking yourselves what you can offer the project. I'm an organizational psychologist. That's the first thing to know. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not a shrink. I can offer three things. First, team building. I spent all my time in business schools, not psychology departments. So I'm particularly interested in organizational issues, especially how people work in teams with a focus on sense-making, how people understand their experience, how they make sense of what's happening to them here and, as we'll see, on the moon, how they construe what's important. Perhaps the emphasis on, on what is important and what isn't important will shift once we're on the moon. I work with people's explicit understanding, but also I help them to surface their tacit knowledge, all the stuff they take for granted, which they may need to re-examine in a new environment. And I look at how people learn about each other's sense-making as they change from a collection of individual experts to a team of experts. Research methodology? Well, although my early years were spent, spent in psychological testing, psychometrics, positivist approaches to understanding people, during the last 30 years or so, I've been teaching business research methods, where constructivist as well as positivist techniques are useful, and I can offer both. Knowledge transfer? Well, I'm actually Polish as well as English. I have a Polish language background. My biggest research grant was for an EU-funded collaboration between the UK, the Netherlands, Haxahoga School, and Poland to support knowledge transfer about the market economy into the post-command economies of Central Europe. So I have a deep interest in cultural differences. And later on, I might have something to offer about how we transfer the knowledge we acquire from the moon simulation to applications back here on Earth. On the organizational side, I suppose I'm a bit of a prompter and a reminder. Here's what I can do, having said a bit about what I am. Prompting and reminding. Leadership roles, for example, we need to think those through. They're important, and I'm puzzling through the priorities there at the moment. There are roles for coordinating team activities within the moon simulation. And then there's the issue of who takes final decisions when people are disagreed and standard operating procedures fail. And how do you manage the overall effort from the Earth, as it were? How about the management of the project? NASA do it with an overall project manager, a flight director, a flight 
or mission commander arrangement. How should we organize ourselves? Which do you think is going to be the best arrangement? Decisions will have to be made about where our simulation takes place. A second life location would be straightforward since we all have the avatar skills but could be very expensive given the size of the region we may need to build on. Or we could do it in open sim. The costs of using a server and equipping ourselves there would be negligible. But it would require builders and visitors to create and equip an entirely new avatar. The one within from within Second Life wouldn't work. It would mean learning some of the skills of traveling and building within an environment which is less well developed, much less well, well developed than Second Life. There again, we already have a base in OpenSim where some of our other simulations are located. So, you know, there are decisions to be made. Maybe we'll be mixing both. Second Life for the Earth base, OpenSim for the Moon base. Who knows? Difficult decisions to be made. Finally, personal sense making. I've started an exercise with the team members at the moment, getting each one to share, fairly systematically, the outcomes they'd like to see as a result of the Moon simulation. And that bottom point, social interaction. This is about involving everyone today, not just the team who are presenting. There will be several teams, as you've gathered, built round our specialisms, and we'll be asking for expressions of interest from you. And so here's a question from me. Who would like to get involved in the organisational psychology role? Please get in touch. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about scripting and uh, what we can do with that. I'm actually offering an invitation uh, for participants in creating an interactive environment for the moon base. Uh, as previous speakers have noted, a virtual world provides enhanced learning through a visual exploratory environment. What can be scripted? Well, we have seen virtual chemistry labs where students can titrate reactions. There are geographical constructs with animated life for ecological study. Uh, there are historical constructs uh, with working ancient architecture. And we have games that teach genetics, just a few of the things that we've already seen. Uh, for our Moonbase project, there will be uh, many interactive possibilities. Let me just throw up a few ideas. We can uh, have, of course, our habitat uh, animated with airlocks and spaceship exterior elevators and spacesuits with various accoutrements, <clears throat> animations for moonwalking, uh, similar things, lunar bugs that can follow preset tracks and so forth. Maybe some fun stuff, uh, some non-player uh, characters um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, uh, would provide information, you know, and all that. So there will be opportunity for anyone interested in creating an interactive uh, scenario to build and script it for the moon base. Uh, we will have common assets such as textures, messes, meshes, uh, script snippets for use by anyone. If you're new to scripting, there are several learning resources within Second Life, and I will certainly provide scripts and tutoring as needed. Uh, so I think it can be very exciting, and I hope people will come forward and be interested in uh, being involved. Uh, with that, I think I will turn the uh, discussion over to Chantel. Thank you, Robert. Um, welcome, everyone. For those um, who've never met me, I'm Chantal Jager. Um, and together with Yes Standard, we are taking care of outreach. Um, 
to support the work of the colleagues behind me. Um, we needed an, an outreach team, and that's where we come in. This is the team, three familiar faces. Um, and if, if you don't uh, know uh, Meryl Johnson, um, she had gave a presentation with Stephen Geisher last month. Um, she will be our liais liaison with Virtual Worlds Education Consortium. But we need more people. We need creative people. We need bridge builders who visit activities and regions of other educational groups in Second Life and bring us new partnerships because this project will be beyond the science circle. We hope to collaborate with different um, educational groups and institutes in Second Life. So what exactly are we going to do? This team will meet weekly from April, devises a campaign and goes out together or separately to network and attract builders and scripters and artists for the moon base teams. We will provide public awareness, advertising and appeal to those who can be an asset to the teams. I will type this in and pronounce it, but to make sure that everyone is able to receive what I am sharing. At the entrance um, of the auditorium, there is a moon base suggestion box. It's a tablet. Click on it to receive a registration form. You will be given a choice of all teams involved and the option to add your suggestion for a name for this project because we don't have a name yet. Save it and put it back in the tablet. Thank you very much for your time and interest. Now back to Natalie. My part of the project goes by the unlikely name of Inreach. Uh, Chan, can you? Advance the slide by one, please. This aspect of the project is going to lag, lag behind all the others because it really involves publication of results. Uh, and by publication, think of that in the widest possible way. Uh, I think first and foremost of publications in one more chant, please. Right, publications in scholarly journals. I think it's really important from the point of view of, of spreading the word about Second Life is a place where creative people can do exciting things. Um, and I think that can be scholarly journals with uh, articles and, and all variety of publications. But I'm also very interested in the aspects that other people have talked about, the ideas of writing stories about this, both science fact and science fiction, um, as well as poetry, artistic, endeavors, anything like that you can think of. As a matter of fact, we've already had one entry into the poetry line that uh, goes against what I initially said about this endeavor lacking, lagging behind the others. Um, uh, we've had uh, one of our group had um, one of the AI bots generate a poem about the moon. Uh, but the real, the real point is we're open and interested and I think we should be very, very, very committed wider distribution and publication in, in serious scientific computing and education journals. And then as some of the crosstalk in the uh, audience has indicated, ultimately this could lead to proposals where we actually get support if we need it to bring um, other people and other entities into involvement in this. So we're very interested in publishing and and as i said we're calling this in reach because it's our attempt to reach into the outside world and both spread the word on the results of this project as well as the um, opportunity 
that is presented by Second Life to do things like this that have an impact on real life. So, as I said, in reach and publishing will lag behind the rest because we have to do something first. But this is this is very much where we want to go with this, and we do have uh, an interest in having a group that is interested in pursuing these various aspects of bringing what we do here to the wider world. So with that, I'll turn the event back to Tab for his comments on construction and wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Sumo. And as, as the group here gathered today they can see, we're really uh, open. It's really an early stage project. And then also to try to get us to the uh, um, question and answer phase of this presentation early, I'm going to go just really quickly. Well, wait a second. I just want to go down quickly what the construction is all about. As an architect, that's an important part of, of the aspect of the project that I'm in interested in. But the moon base presents some very unique um, challenges in regard to it's not going to be construction the way we think of construction on uh, the earth. It's not going to be building something from scratch with two by fours and materials that are available from Home Depot. It'll be more of a constructing something. Yeah, it won't be stick built. Um, we really have to protect people from radiation. It's been mentioned briefly here, but it's one of the most important things about creating a habitat on the moon is we really have to protect, uh, protect all of the astronauts from um, being um, affected by radiation. They wear, wear special suits uh, to protect them from radiation when they're walking around. Um, when uh, they're living in an environment that we want to be able to talk about them taking the spacesuits off, they need to be protected from radiation then. And one of the most interesting things I've found, and there's someone in the audience that knows more about this than I do, and hopefully she'll be joining the team and speaking about this very soon for us, is using the lava tubes that exist on the moon, and um, it was mentioned earlier, that um, are really fascinating possibilities because some of them are really quite large and uh, could be developed, uh, housing could be developed inside of those. And those do a fine job in many cases of protecting people inside from the radiation from the sun uh, that is the uh, radiation that we're trying to take care of. That we don't have that as much of a problem of that on Earth because we have the Earth's atmosphere. With no moon atmosphere, we really need to rely on very, very significant shielding to protect the people that we send up there. And then the, the dirt or the earth that's on the moon is referred to as regolith because obviously it wouldn't be right to call it earth because it's the moon. And so if you hear the term regolith, that is the dirt and sand and gravel that's on the surface of the moon. And that may be used in two ways. One, we could have a, a sort of inflatable dome that is then covered with regolith to get the necessary shielding. Well, there's also exploring the uh, possible creation of uh, 3D printing on the moon using the regolith as part of the uh, ingredients that um, are used to actually print a building uh, in 3D printing. We'll be talking about that later in the program, not today, but um, later as the uh, process um, continues and we begin to uh, have team members that are working on the various aspects. Um, and then on the list here, it says regolith covered inflatables. That's another possibility that we'll be looking at. And so there's exciting, um, interesting uh, possibilities on the moon. And then, Phil, do you mind advancing my slide again to the next one? Thank you very much. So today, I think everybody did a really good job of making it clear that we're recruiting team members here today. And we want everybody to feel welcome. Um, as possible participants. Um, and if you're uncertain, you can sign up for more than one team or you can you know, have, be on two teams and decide which one you like best. We're not trying to force people into a decision that um, paralyzes you from making one and then you don't join a team. So please feel welcome to sign up as um, 
uh, Chantal explained the sign-up sheets uh, for that. The other thing is, a lot of it is, you know, we're going to default to thinking it's a science project, but we've had so many discussions among the team members you see here in our meetings leading up to this that make us realize is that, you know, we've had discussions of getting science fiction writers involved, um, as was mentioned. Uh, the other thing is we'll probably be able to do more of an international uh, collaboration than even NASA and uh, the European Space Agency and JAXA, the Japan uh, Space Agency, can do just because um, Second Life is such a international uh, group of people that we have in here. And then so the other thing we want to do is we don't want people to panic and think, oh my god, this is going to be you know, a lot of trouble and a lot of work and we're in a rush to do it. We're not in a rush to do it. One of the main things we all want to maintain on this project is just a balance of everybody's time and understanding that this is Second Life and we all contribute as we can. And also to keep it a fun project that's really interesting for everybody to be involved in. And um, so that's the, uh, the, the overview of the project. And uh, again, please join Second uh, Science Circle, uh, the Second the Science Circle, if you haven't joined yet. We like members to join that. And then start looking at what kind of team you'd like to be on, even to the point of where if you'd like to create a team that we haven't mentioned or referenced yet, uh, please feel free to uh, you know talk to any of us up here. Um, it really is a team sport, and you'll uh, enjoy working with this group. It's a great group of people to work with. And uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And um, I'll let um, Simo and Chan uh, sort of coordinate the uh, the questions that might be uh, coming up from the audience now. Thanks again. Well, I haven't really got a closing um, comment or anything. Um, I think we organized this panel to get the conversation going, to start inviting people, uh, not just from the science circle and the students group, but also from other groups, um, to get an documents from the tablet, consider joining one or more teams, um, come up with a good name, we really need one, uh, so we can start working on a logo. Uh, there is a lot going on and a lot of work for everyone there is a role, I'm certain of it. Um, like my colleagues already explained, there is so much to do. Um, and like Tab mentioned, if you know a team we didn't mention yet, but would be an asset to the entire project, please share it in a note card with us um, in a few weeks. If you sign up, you will receive an email from either one of us uh, to get you involved and uh, get the ball rolling. So for now, Please share your questions with us. There have already been a lot of comments and uh, questions in the chat, but you know, if there are more, I mean, please, uh, we're, we're happy to answer your questions and address your comments. We didn't set time, uh, Bryony. Um, we gave ourselves permission to take as long as we need. It is a complicated project. It involves a lot of thinking and a lot of rebuilding, probably, uh, and a lot of testing and a lot of writing. Um, so to all of us, it is most important uh, to take our time. No time limits. It's probably safe to say that our moon base will be done before the real moon base. So as you can see, you don't have to be a astrophysicist. You can be an illustrator, you can be a musician, you can be an artist, you can be just a curious person. Uh, we need all of you. We are looking at moon myths. 
um, and things associated with the moon. When I, you know, before they landed on the moon, they seriously, uh, people, when I was a kid, they were talking about moon made of green cheese, and they seriously did not know whether the uh, lander would uh, be sucked up by dust. I mean, there's a huge amount of things associated with the moon over thousands of years, and so we're exploring some of the moon myths as well. If you know about those, uh, you're uh, please talk with us. We're particularly proud of the fact in Science Circle that we are international. You can hear it in the accents. You can hear it in the uh, in the names and contributions and such, and we consider that one of the strongest assets for the science circle that we have members from all over the world. And so your perspective is uh, definitely welcomed. Yeah, Tag uh, brought up an interesting point. Uh, he brings up a number of interesting points. One is about um, how artists will be important. Um, and this has been mentioned by our group as well, but um, our team, but uh, something to think about. We'd love to have artists, because this isn't just STEM, it's STEAM as art as well. Um, art, our art will, our artists will be, can make a very important contribution to what we're doing. And I mentioned seriously that, uh, you know, if you look at the ISS and you look at the spacecraft and stuff, uh, they're very technical looking and they're very usually um, uh, only a few colors, uh, uh, verging on from white to black. <laughs> and so, uh, if you're going to live in a place that's so far removed from the Earth and do things, there's no reason why we can't have color. But color has international and social impact. So we need somebody who knows color and knows about the uh, social aspects of it. Uh, it doesn't have to be a dreary place. Art, music, color. But technically, ambient sound on the moon itself would be <laughs> pretty quiet. Not that uh, quiet doesn't have its place. Uh, but if we're going to make it realistic, we've got scripts. But then again, we need to have sounds as well to go with the scripts. Yeah, since we're talking about art, I've only been talking about scientific innovations uh, that will help human beings and, and people living on Earth. Um, what about artistic innovations? There may be um, um, really impressive um, artistic uh, innovations um, from artists on the moon. Okay, you just inspired me. I'm thinking of uh, what would it be like to squeeze tubes of paint in a one-sixth gravity? <laughs> in other words, what would, uh, like Jackson Pollock or whatever, what would you get? What would you, uh, that would be a, a fabulous thing. Slow splatters, yes. Or splatters that look like uh, moon craters or other things. There could be a lot of innovation. Sculpture, that's, yeah, that's right. Uh, what can you do? What can you sculpt in low gravity? You might get some really unusual um, statues that way. And so this is the reason why we're bringing it up to you, because we agreed to facilitate or lead these areas, but uh, we can't think of everything. And so there is, uh, if you've, you've all been around a second life, and second life is a marvelously uh, rich uh, expression of imagination and innovation. Um, and so we want to to share what we are excited about so that others can share that excitement with us. Well, there's an interesting idea that I've heard about um, because of the low gravity. If you are sitting, let's say, you're, you're, drink, you're having your breakfast, drinking your orange juice on the moon, and you accidentally spill your orange juice, oh no, but if you grab your glass, you could actually uh, catch the spill before it hits the ground. It's possible. So that makes me think, well, what interesting physics experiments could you do with that in mind? Or uh, interesting spatters if you're doing something art artistic? Who for thought? Yeah, one, one interesting idea is just uh, someone sent to me an IM 
Um, is, what about swimming on the moon? You have a pool on the moon. What would swimming be like? <laughs> that could be very graceful. Let me close this presentation formally, but please stay for a conversation if you continue to appreciate it. But for the film, let's end today's meeting. Thank you all for coming and for dropping note cards because I received messages. They are already coming in. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for your time and um, we hope to see you return to participate.